check out ESPN Films' newly released 30 for 30 podcasts. From the producers of our award-winning documentary series, this is an amazing collection of sports stories you need to hear to believe. Speaking of amazing, Delta Airlines and the Fly Delta app make your travel experience amazingly easy with real-time bag tracking, e-boarding, and passport scanning during check-in. And don't forget to download 30 for 30 podcasts to fill your flight with stories that will keep you coming back for more. And now, Jalen and Jacoby on ESPN Radio. When I pop the trunk, head to the Yeah, I pop the trunk, I pop the hood. Now act stupid, I pop the trunk. Now give me your po-po, po-po. Here's Jalen Rose. What up, dog? I'm David Jacoby. And on the cool check-in. This is the Jalen and Jacoby Mock NBA Draft Special. We made it, Jalen. We get a people what they want. Let's do it. I should have brought my red and white suit. We made it. You, should, but you didn't bring the red and white suit? No. What? Do you still have the red and white suit? I do. You are so famous for that bad it's suit. It's hanging in the home that it purchased. Well done. And I'm looking at a man <laughs> with the teeth that it purchased as well. Yes, indeed. As I said, we've got a lot to get to. We're going to be going deep in the draft. We'll be giving you some upside guys that you may not heard of. We'll be joined by Fran Fraschella, draft specialist, giving us some international flair. But right now, we are going to focus on the first five picks. We're going to mock out the first five picks. And, of course, we're going to start with number one. If the people wanted drama heading into Thursday night's NBA draft, that's exactly what the people got. The Celtics and the Sixers made a blockbuster trade, sending the number one pick to Philly, the number three pick, and future picks to Boston. In this segment, we're going to go through the first five picks of the NBA draft. Jalen, why did the Sixers give up so much to make sure they had the number one pick in this year's draft? Big shout to Sam Hinkie, who was the guy that talked a lot about trusting the process for the Philadelphia 76ers. Obviously, Jerry Colangelo and his son Brian have come in and have taken the baton. Joel Embiid, who clearly was a part of the process so much that he made that his nickname, now all of a sudden they get a chance to put themselves in position to not only acquire more talent to go with what they've been able to do the last couple of years in the draft, but to get the number one overall pick. And that will be Markel Fultz out of Washington. Averages 25 points, six rebounds, six assists, can play off the bounce, can play off the catch, a prolific score, in particular in pick-and-roll situations. They want Ben Simmons to be the primary ball handler at 6'10". He's not much of a shooter. Now all of a sudden you have he and or Fultz that could be the primary ball handler for a team that clearly needs help in his backcourt because they had the one of the lowest scoring backcourts in the entire league last year. Why do you think this was so important for the Sixers? Because at the number three spot, could have ended up with Josh Jackson. They could have ended up with De'Aaron Fox. They could have drafted someone like Jason Tatum. Why do you think they leveraged some future picks just to get Fultz? Like the great American philosopher Biz Markey would say, You got what I need! (laughs) And if you look at Lonzo Ball, he's not necessarily the player that's going to be as effective playing away from the Rock. And also... Having a situation where you could get Fultz, a guy that's already established himself as somebody that can be a prolific scorer, not only in college, but you hopes with hopes that that's going to translate to the NBA. And or Josh Jackson, as you mentioned, who's more of a wing slasher type player who's going to feed off of offense, not necessarily create offense. You want Fultz to be that guy. They pegged him to be the number one overall prospect. The Boston Celtics feel like they're going to be able to get their guy regardless while attaining more assets to put them in a position to possibly get a vet. So it's a win-win for both teams. It does feel like a win-win for both teams. Danny Ainge just finds himself with more future picks, just more future picks. He is stockpiling those picks for the future. We'll see what he does with that in the number three spot. But first, Magic Johnson, Rob Palenka will be selecting for the Los Angeles Lakers at number two. And what do you think they do? Like LeVar said, the Lakers going to get that ball, and then they going to get that ball. (laughs) The hometown kid will be suiting up for the Lakers, and that's 
Anybody that follows Jalen and Jacoby, you understand that Paul George is trying to find his way to Laker purple and gold as well. And so now you have a pass-first guy whose goal is going to make everybody around him better. Yes, he has an unorthodox jump shot. He's pretty athletic. He plays well in transition. He's going to have to diversify his offensive portfolio more than just shooting threes and layups. But I do think as a tall point guard, that's just something that's so intriguing that Irvin Magic Johnson can't turn down the opportunity to mold a player like this, like Clay. And plus, you know the Lakers are not only about winning games, but about selling tickets. And so yeah. if this young man becomes the type of prospect that um, his father says that he can be, then the Lakers are going to do just fine selecting him at number two. Very interesting stat from Lonzo Ball. You've made an allusion to the fact that he only shoots threes and layups. He almost literally only shoots threes and layups. While he was at UCLA, he's got 189 field goals. 102 of those are threes. 80 of those are finishes at the rim. That's just the way it is. But also, here's the thing. When you're a tall point guard, you're not going to necessarily be able to rely on your speed to blow past defenders. And while he's a really good athlete, he's not going to be the best athlete on the floor. No. Which means you're not going to be able to attack the rim and constantly finish over bigs. So mid-range runners and floaters and pull-up jumpers, especially when the defense is in retreat mode off of a pick-and-roll situation, that's going to have to become his money. With everything that's happening with Paul George, could you see the Lakers packaging this number two pick and some other assets and trying to make a run at trading for Paul George before his free agency? Uh, don't do it. Please don't do it. We saw this happen with Carmelo Anthony. He decided that he wanted to go to New York. So the Knicks mortgaged a lot of their future young talent. Bagnani, Wilson Chandler, and all of a sudden they're in Denver. And the Knicks and the Nuggets, since Carmelo left, virtually have the same record and so if Paul George is on wax saying that he wants to come to Los Angeles here's how you circumvent the proceedings if you're the Pacers you trade him to a team not lost and you trade him to a team not in purple and gold you force him to walk away from his fifth year of money which could be around 35 40 million dollars because your current team can sign you to five years your new team is going to be able to sign you to four years this is why you hear the rumblings of the Pacers now reaching out to the Cleveland Cavaliers. And then we have Danny Ainge and the Boston Celtics with the number three pick. Who do you think they select with the number three spot? This one's really tricky because they took Jalen Brown as the number three overall pick as a wing last year. Mm -hmm. He showed some promise during the season. Then he had some ups and downs like a lot of rookies do and finished the season pretty strong, getting minutes on a team that was a number one seed. And for the Celtics, here's how the Fultz situation works. You bring him in for a workout, and you're like, wait a minute. He's 6'3", 6 6'4", 6 but he's not going to score 30 like Isaiah Thomas. Nope. And Avery Bradley could probably lock him up. We're just fine in our backcourt. How can we beat the Cleveland Cavaliers? We need to get more wing strength. Josh Jackson gives them that. He's a wiry athlete. He's a pogo stick. In particular, finishing with lobs and also attacking the hoop. He's a much better ball handler, as people are going to see once he gets to the league. He's a fearless performer. I think he'll slide right in just because at the number three slot, just because at the number three slot, I would rather see them take somebody that could play alongside Al Horford. We saw Amir Johnson in and out of the lineup. We saw Kelly Olenek in and out of the lineup. They truly need somebody to play that role. This is why you stockpile picks to try to see, hey, are we going to be able to get Gordon Hayward and pair him back up with Brad Stevens because they were together at Butler? And then you're obviously going to reach out and see, hey, what's going on with Jimmy Butler? But more importantly, they will, with those picks and those assets, have to address the other big spot playing alongside Al Horford. You've got potentially Gordon Hayward coming to Boston as well. Do you think that Josh Jackson could work underneath him or alongside of him? I think they work together because Josh is taller. You hope that he's going to be able to certain, do certain things that Gordon Hayward can't do, like um, consistently guard LeBron James, put him on Kevin Durant, 
Put them on Kawhi Leonard. If you look at where the league is going, you're going to need that caliber athlete with that height and that fearlessness that's going to want to go up and challenge some of the players that I mentioned. At the fourth spot, we have the Phoenix Suns, a team that really needs to hit their pick at number four. Who do you see them selecting? First and foremost, look a little bit closer at the Phoenix Suns. Okay. Yes, they look a lot like the um, Kentucky Wildcats. They have so many of John Calipari's players on their team. Yep. Like, he might as well become the general manager. And I give him props because one of those guys, Devin Booker, who had a season-high 70 points against said Boston Celtics, wow. not against a lottery team, really shows you his promise. Now you add a Jason Tatum out of Duke to go alongside with him. An isolation caliber player. He's silky smooth. He can play off the bounce, plays more mid-range, turns over both shoulders. The key for him, however, is he going to have the foot speed to guard threes Mm. and or the size and physicality to play against fours. But I do think he's going to be the selection at number four. And then at number five, we have the dumpster fire that is the Sacramento Kings. Who is going to be the lucky player to find themselves in Sacramento? Yeah, yeah. They're going to take the blur, the road runner, De'Aaron Fox. When you trade a player like DeMarcus Cousins, an all-NBA performer, you look on paper and say, what did they get in return? Do, do you remember who they traded for Boogie Cousins? Do you actually know? Yes. Buddy Heald, who did Tyreek they trade? Evans. Buddy Heald, Tyreek Evans, and I think like a can of soda. Exactly. So now you're going to need somebody in a Western Conference. When you look at the matchups on a nightly basis – Let me see. Who's coming to town? Steph Curry, CP3, Mm. Mike Conley, Dame Lillard. You have to find somebody that's going to compete against those guys. And so also have somebody to break down the defense and create offense for the bigs around you, like Kali Stein, who needs someone to penetrate, give them drop passes, and or throw them lobs. Mm -hmm. So I think Fox is going to be the choice for the Kings. A team is about to draft a player named Harry Giles. That's only scored 10 points. That's five buckets. Twice in his college career. Oh, by the way, tore his left ACL, MCL in 2013, tore his right ACL in 2015, and had a left knee procedure in 2016. How many knees do you have, Jalen Rose? I have two. How many knees did Harry Giles injure and have surgically repaired? Multiple. Almost like the game of operation. Exactly. This is not someone that I want my team to pick. And what makes it more questionable and a risk, he averages less than four points, four rebounds. A lottery pick? But coming out of high school, he's a McDonald's Mm All-American. He went to Duke. Had he not had those injuries, I think he would have been a lot more productive. He does shoot 57% from the floor. He's shown good skills for a big man, keeps the ball high, can turn over both shoulders, has a nice hook, does have great potential. Can he stay healthy is going to be the major key. You know who I'm targeting next? Targeting is the word? I'm targeting next. (laughs) You're such a bully. Mark Helfoltz. Everyone has decided that this is the best basketball player in the draft. Everyone has him going number one, so much so that the Celtics might even trade him so someone else can have the rights to Markel Fultz. And I'm not going to do the hack thing and be like, well, his team wasn't that good. Basketball's a team sport. Sometimes your teammates aren't that good. You can't do everything yourself. But individually, he does have some deficiencies. His individual defensive rating is 110.8. That's an estimate of how many points per 100 possessions you would give up. That's a lot. That would be the worst of any number one pick since 2010. Defense is 50% of the game, and he is an individually a poor defender. And he's going to be the number one pick in the draft. What did you say his defensive rating was again? 110.8. Isaiah Thomas, this season for the Boston Celtics, almost averaged 30 points. Mm -hmm. And there's a statistic that went around that basically acknowledged that he probably was the worst on-ball defender in the entire league. I think it was like second worst, like number 365 or something. When you're scoring the way he's scoring, it's okay. Do you think Markel Fultz has the ability to score like that? He gets buckets consistently. This is why he led all major conference players in points per game. This is why he's projected to go number one overall in the draft. 
because he can get buckets at different phases and he will be a productive scorer on the next level. Now I'm looking at Lonzo Ball, the projected number two pick. I'm not going to talk about his dad. Like his, you just did. I'm not going to talk about his dad. You just did. I just said I'm not going to talk about his dad. That's you not just talking did. about his dad, Jalen Rose. No, you're nitpicking now. No, can you're I tell you? Can I tell you? No, you can't tell me. You know what? You know what? You can't tell me. You just you just talked about Giles and Fultz. You didn't mention their parents. No, you did talk about Lonzo's dad. Please continue. I didn't talk about Lonzo's dad. I didn't. <laughs> okay. You said this earlier like it was a positive thing, okay? 189 field goals for UCLA. I didn't say it was positive. 80 of those were three-point shots. 102 of those were layups. And only seven were basically mid-range or floaters and runners. Seven mid-range floaters or runners. Like When I look at his game, he literally need to call an archaeologist to find the mid-range part of his game. Daryl Morey is somewhere being like, well, this is the perfect player for the new NBA. No, it's not. (laughs) Like, How is it only seven times you got a bucket that was not a layup or a three-point shot? All season. All season long. And he played. He played real minutes. That's a lot of games. This, to me, is a deficiency on offense. I don't know if that is the type of player you want to pick with the number two pick in the draft. I'm picking him because not only do I get him, I get his dad. We're not talking about his dad. So I'm moving on. <laughs> and you know how much I love him. Another person who seems to be like the prototypical player for the new NBA. Lowry Markinen. Everyone's so high on him. I was high on him. I watched him play at Arizona. He hits threes. He gets three-point shots. He reminds me of like a Chris Tass Porzingis. And type. we thought they would make it to the Final Four because of him. Well, guess what? Here's my problem with him. He is seven feet tall. He stands up and puts his arm above his head, and he can Mm -hmm. basically touch the rim, okay? Okay. He gets 4.8 defensive rebounds a game. How many? he plays minutes. 4.8 defensive rebounds a game. How are you seven feet tall, and you get 4.8 defensive rebounds a game? Data Kardashian? That's a great point. I didn't even think about that. (laughs) Lowry Market is clearly dating a Kardashian. But I don't think he fits the profile. Please continue. I see what you did there. (laughs) <laughs> what we have here is not Chris Porzingis. This is White Channing Fry. That's who we have. We have White Channing Fry. He can shoot some threes. He's got height, but he's not going to do anything around the basket. He's not going to get you any rebounds. He is just basically, you project him to turn into this rim protector stretch five. What he has ended up going to be is tall three-point shooter. Where did Fry go to college? Arizona. Where does this young man go to college? Arizona. So... I like the fact that you compare those two as players. It's truly accurate because that's the strength of his game. He's not going to be the kind of guy that comes in and, and is among the le- uh, He's not going to be the type of player that's among the league leaders in rebounds and blocks. That's just not the makeup of who he is, especially early in his career. Next on my list is Jason Tatum. What you say about him is always versatile. Oh, he can shoot and he can, you know, he can play inside and outside. But here's what I see with Jason Tatum is someone who does a lot of things pretty well, but nothing great. Like too slow to guard point guards and guards in the NBA and too small to bang with bigs in the NBA. He just kind of feels like a, an in-betweener to me. Like there's no real spot for him on the floor in the National Basketball Association. There's an era that's taking place. It's called positionless basketball. And in Tatum's case, as long as you can dribble, pass, and shoot, can he? We have a spot for you. Can he dribble? Can he pass? He can dribble. He doesn't have a handle, which is way different. He can dribble well enough to get a shot off. One or two dribbles, play off a live dribble, jab step. He can play well enough to get his own shot off. But what you say is truly accurate. Will he be a jack of all trades and master of none? Remains to be seen. I would take I would bet on the fact that he's going to be a productive player. You know another problem I have with him? I don't like the Y in Jason. <laughs> Just we don't need that. We don't need the Y in Jason. What about the Y in Jalen? We don't need the Y in Jalen either. We don't need these things. Drop the Ys. They're unnecessary Ys. I know I've gotten older officially when I have a remote control in my hand and I'm watching the NFL and NBA drafts and players getting named Jalen are getting picked. I've got one more. Players named Jalen are getting picked. I've got one more. Justin Jackson. No, 
He's a good player. He doesn't get spoken about too much in pre preparation for this draft because people want to focus on the first 10 picks or whatever. But he was a good player in North Carolina for a long time. However, his field goal percentage got worse every single year he was in college. Three years ago, 47%. Two years ago, 46%. Last year, 44%. So your ability to score baskets has gone down as you have spent more time in college. That's not a good indication for me. Who won the championship this year? North Carolina. What team did he play on again? North Carolina. Okay. So you're not taking winning into account at all. This is That's a team game. This is an individual who's going to be drafted onto a different team. An individual whose field goal percentage went down every single year he was at North Carolina. That is something to pay attention to, but to me that's not the end-all, be-all for a player because the looks that he's going to get in the league won't necessarily mirror the ones that he got in college. And for those mm. that truly have to pay attention to the smart. game, I see what you did there. the shots are a lot different. The lane line is smaller in college. The shot clock is different. The three-point line is different. I'm still scratching my head watching American-born basketball where approximately only eight states have a shot clock. We're not helping the American born players until we allow the rules to be like, until we have the rules mirror each other a little more. In high school, 32 minutes, college, 40 minutes, in the league, 48 minutes. It's a different ball. It's a different three point shot. It's a different lane it's line. Court. The fouls are different. If we get some consistency there, that would truly help these players catch up to what now I see are international-born players who get a chance to play professional early with those rules, learning to dribble, pass, and shoot, and getting paid, and not forced to go to college. And so now when you're watching the draft, a lot of those players have been, in a lot of cases, further along skill-wise. Being negative is tiring. I'm glad this is over. <laughs> Blue Moon is brewed with Valencia orange peel and a touch of coriander. It's a creative twist on a Belgian-style wheat ale for a taste that shines brighter. Taste responsibly. Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado. Welcome back to Jalen and Jacoby's Welcome Mock back. Draft Special. <laughs> we don't have too many guests on our show. VIP. You know I'm we don't honored. have too many guests. So when we have <laughs> guests, you know they are good guests. We I'm are honored. now joined by Fred Michella. <laughs> Oh, uh, I'm pumped, man. Just to be with you guys and uh, talking hoops. This is yes, your indeed. time of year. We yeah, have to have you on. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to yeah. take this segment, and everyone focuses on like the first five picks, the first ten yeah. picks. There's a lot of players that can change franchises that get picked outside of that lottery zone or those first few picks. We're going to focus on the upside guys. Mm -hmm. Upside guys. What does that mean to you when you hear that? It means they're freshmen, more, mm. more often than not. Because if you look at this draft this year, uh, when you just count them up, probably 15 freshmen, and the international guys, the three guys that I think will go in the first round, they're teenagers too. Yeah. So when we talk upside, you know, that's kind of good news, bad news for teams. Mm. Because on the one hand, you're trying to make your team better, and yet you realize you're taking a young big guy, for example, and you're going, there's no way this guy's going to help us win for a couple of years. But we know that in time, with, the, with good coaching and the right attitude, a kid like a Justin Patton, for example, yep. seven feet tall from yep. Creighton. You look at him, you go, this guy's going to be really good. So let's let's start with Justin Patton yeah. from Creighton then. I love that he is 6'11 and has a 7'3 wingspan. Mm -hmm. I hate that he shoots 51% from the free throw line. What do you <laughs> see from Justin Patton? Well, it's interesting. He does shoot 51% from the free throw line, but he made uh, made some threes this year. Mm -hmm. But but really what he is is he's a long he's, – you know what? He's a big piece of silly putty. He mm. is a seven-foot piece of silly putty. NBA silly putty because he's long and athletic. He's got great hands and great agility, runs the floor well, um, and he's kind of a, a late bloomer, so you just don't know how much better he can keep getting. And uh, when I say silly putty, the minute you draft him, Jalen, you, your coaches, starting in summer league, have got to grab this guy and say, okay, we're going to make you an NBA whatever, power forward, stretch four, stretch five. So you look at a guy like Justin Patton, and by the way, a lot of young big guys in the middle of this first round, and you're you're looking at guys that you're going to have to mold but aren't, aren't ready to win games. I yeah. got another young big guy for you. He yeah. played at Gonzaga, Zach Collins. Mm. Yeah, What do yeah. you think about him as an upside guy? You know what I love about him? Think about this. In high school at Bishop Gorman, he didn't start until his senior year because he was backing up Chase Jeter, who went to Duke, 
and Steven Zimmerman, who went to Vegas and I think was drafted by Orlando last year. And then when he goes to Gonzaga this year on that really good team, he's backing up. Still in the backup. The big fella. Easy back it up. And yeah. now he's going to get picked in the lottery <laughs> in the NBA he's draft. Lottery. He's, he's a lottery guy. And what, what you like about him is with his size, his ability to play inside and out, there's one thing that sticks out to me, chip on his shoulder. Mm. He's, he's got he's got a chip on his shoulder, which I think you know. You go to the league and people mm-hmm. start trying to, you know, um, bully you around. Bully you around. Yeah. Especially you're as thin as he is. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. And but you 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 want to see some fight, correct? And with him, I think you're going to see some fight, and then uh, you know, long term development. But as a follow up with him, I appreciated the fact in the Final Four, mm-hmm. eleven points, ten boards, four and a half blocks. Really foul prone. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's one yeah. of the reasons why him being a substitute actually helps the team. Because yeah. he can't play extended minutes. What yeah. about that in the league where you actually get six fouls now? If there's one thing I think he's going to have to get better at, and that this would have been whether he started or not at Gonzaga, is, is defense. Is he really can't guard anybody? He can't guard a physical, you know, Zach Randolph, Andre Drummond type of inside player right now. But uh, I do like the, I like his toughness, and I like the fact that we're talking about a 19 year old guy. Yeah. So my big thing with these young big guys is tell me what they're going to be when they're 23, because that's what you're doing now. This is these guys are upset. Play, yeah, these, these guys. I don't know if you guys like this analogy, but when I watch college basketball during the season. I'm watching Double A baseball compared to the major leagues. When we see a guy like uh, Mirotic come out of uh, Real Madrid and mm-hmm. come to the Chicago Bulls, that guy was playing Triple A because he's in the Euro League. Yep. But when you get a kid out of Gonzaga or, or Kansas, you're talking about a kid like Zach Collins. He's hitting 280 in Double A. That makes sense. Absolutely, it does. Let's yeah. I normally carry a bat, but I sold out. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stay with the young bigs. We've got. John Collins. Not Zach yeah. Collins. John Collins yeah. from Wake Forest. Can't guard you. You, you, the, you, know, that, you know the big game you had yesterday? Yeah. <laughs> you know Jalen was feeding you? He can probably guard me. He can probably know. guard me. He probably I don't guard know. Me. He, had a, he had a monster ACC season uh, scoring. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was a double double machine. Mm-hmm. But the one thing, like he was a conscientious objector on the defensive end. Oh, and he was that, getting his number and, and third in a, points in the ACC, yeah. second yep. in boards, first in field yeah. goal percentage. But he was in foul trouble a lot as a freshman. So maybe this year he goes, you know what? Or maybe Danny Manning said, "Listen, we need you on the court." And I was like this, hey. If you got a choice of giving up a basket or picking up your third foul, give let, up the basket. Let the guy score. <laughs> <laughs> he so, did that a lot. Yeah, he did that. A Here's lot. a question for you about John Collins, Jalen. He's only attempted one three. One three-point shot. Can you be in the NBA now, even if you're a big, and just not have a three-point shot? You can, but ultimately they will develop your three-point shooting. Look no further than a player like Al Horford Mm. on the number one seed at Boston Celtics. He wasn't shooting threes at all. Now he primarily shoots threes. Mm -hmm. Look at Kevin Love. The exact same thing. It's just a maturation of your game. Now it's head scratching when I hear Dwight Howard talking about yeah. he's going to shoot threes yeah. when he can't shoot free throws or <laughs> play on the post. But I do think that that's a natural maturation of young players. What are your thoughts? On yeah, that? and with John Collins, he was really good from 17 feet and in, mm. and really accurate. So now you look at a guy like that, and you know he's not going to psychology class next year. He's going to the gym, and when they're not practicing, because you guys played so many games, he is going to be practicing with the player development guys because he's likely not to have a key role right away. So he can he can hone that uh, deep ball. Yes, indeed. That's what the young bigs, the cool kids are doing. Yeah. Anthony Davis, <laughs> Boogie Cousins, Carl Anthony Towns. I mean, they're, they're, all, they're, all, they're, hey, there. they're all following what Bargnani did. You know? <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> they're, all, they're all trying to be Bargnani. Uh, it was about no. half a season you tried to be Bargnani. <laughs> That work out great. Uh, maybe maybe him- Tom Chambers. <laughs> <laughs> Ike Anibogu. So here's my question about him. Yeah. He only played 20 minutes once. He's played 20 minutes in a game once. And here he is about to walk across the stage yeah. and join an NBA team. It baffles me. He's tricking somebody. He He's tricking somebody. He's the youngest player in the draft, I believe. And he's a terrific athlete. But his skill level is low. But nobody really knows that his skill level is that low. Why? Because he played on a great team Mm -hmm. with a great point guard. A great passer. A great passer. He caught a lot of lobs. And could he be a good uh, energy big? Tristan Thompson sort of thing. Down the road. But right now, I mean, if he plays next year without Lonzo Ball, he might get exposed. This is a good time to come out. 
It's going to definitely be about his will, not about his skill, if he's going to have a long career. I was just looking at his stats. I was like, wait a second. He played, like, his coach decided that he would only valuable on the court for 20 minutes one time in his career. To me, that's an indicator. Yeah. And Finally, it, yeah. Jalen will not let us end this segment without speaking about the Wolverine. Hail to the victors. DJ Wilson. Jalen, we'll start with you. I'm excited that these past few years, Wolverines are actually getting drafted in the first <laughs> round. Because it took a long time. I shouldn't yeah. have left Trey you. Burke, Trey Burke, you got drafted. They uh. started the new trend. Him and Glenn Robinson the third. Trey Burke. Trey Burke. Yeah. yeah and and uh, uh, Stauskas. Yeah, yeah, Nick Stauskas. Yeah. Yeah. Trey Burke. Glenn Robinson the third. My guy who couldn't stay out the medicinal. <laughs> oh, Mitch, Mitch McGarry. Mitch. 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 Yeah. Yes, indeed. And now... Yeah. And they didn't go over the cap. And Tim Hardaway Jr. They didn't go. And and the best of the bunch has actually been Tim Hardaway Jr., who's found his way in the league. So, what do you think about the prospect, DJ Wilson? Because you know I'm clearly unbiased. No, no, no. You know what? Uh, First of all, he he made a huge jump from his freshman year to his sophomore year, and then he was hurt for a year, so he's really Mm -hmm. a third year sophomore. But he is the prototype. Stretch four yep. in the league because he'll be able to guard stretch fours. And by the way, he's going to guard second unit stretch fours. He's not guarding the best of the best. He's going to be playing, you know, if he's getting minutes next year, it's going to be in the second quarter. Mm. And so he can grow into that role. And then he has also proven that he can make some threes. So between guarding stretch fours and making threes, he's coming into the league at a perfect time. Uh, it, you know, if he, I think he's going to go in the first round because someone's going to look at him and say, we can mold that guy into the way this league is, is space and pace. And he needs to wear longer shorts. That's my only thing I need to say. <laughs> Got to switch that Pull up. Pull him aside. Pull him aside on draft. They don't know the tradition. They don't know. They don't know the tradition. We started something you know in Michigan with the coach? shorts. Yes, Let's indeed. not go the other way. I, yes, Will- I heard DJ Wilson like Stockton. I heard that was his guy. <laughs> <laughs> Who else could the Lakers pick besides Lonzo Ball? Well, they could take De'Aaron Fox, mm-hmm. okay? And I think this is all a smokescreen about Lonzo's workout. He wasn't in shape. And now think about this. You grew up with the Showtime, right? Absolutely. Think about if they don't take Lonzo Ball. Think about next year when the Lakers win eight games in a row. What's it going to be? It's Lonzo Ball. You know what I mean? It's not Showtime. It's Lonzo Ball. Correct. And but- they're not just drafting a productive player. They're also drafting somebody that can – Change the needle yeah. as it relates to superstardom, and I, th- I, I think Levar, I, don't, I don't think I, I think I think Levar Ball changed his name. See, I think I think his name was like Simpkins. Oh, you know what I mean? Oh, you know I what, never, I, never you know what I mean? That. I think he changed his name because yeah, he said, Wait a I mean, cause, cause if the Lakers were going to draft Lonzo Simpkins, <laughs> come on, man. But now they might take, they might have, they might have Lonzo Ball. That's smart. So, so you know, could Fox be the guy? They're playing games. All the stuff about his mm. uh, uh, ball not being in shape. It, everybody's lying this last two weeks before the draft. Every team's lying because nobody's going to tell the truth. And, right? Absolutely. And also, if you take Fox to go with D'Angelo Russell, you're too small in the backcourt. Yeah. That's a good yeah. point. I think what has happened to Zoe Ball's name and what has happened with his father has overlooked the fact that he's going to be a terrific pass-first guard. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people try to say, how is that going to relate to his teammates, having a dad that's really boisterous? It would be different if his skill was to be a volume scorer. Then you got to earn the respect of your teammates to get 20 shots. But since he's going to make grown men better... And all they got to do is catch and finish. Everybody likes a pass. Hey, they're going to love him. Hey, when they they get, don't care. Uh, they're going to start <laughs> buying his shoes for him. <laughs> and when they get better, when they, <laughs> hey, when they get better and contract time comes up, what happens? They're going to start buying his shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Sign me up. Yeah. The other thing that happens every time I watch the draft is I'm a very sensitive person. And there's always that one player that was projected to go high yeah. that just continually gets missed and missed and missed, doesn't get picked. And then we have the shots of them. We stare at them. Yeah. It makes me want to cry I've on my I've been couch. there. <laughs> I feel like Moss at the draft. I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, Maybe I shouldn't have worn this red and white ten. suit. <laughs> and and red red and you were on everyone's draft board until they saw the suit. suit. It, it was the suit. suit. Yeah, yeah, it was the suit. No, this <laughs> is your game. Your yeah. game is proven at that point. It was the suit. They're like, that's a bad decision maker. Right there. It's not a good decision maker. <laughs> Who could be that guy this year that we all project to go high but ends up just sliding and sliding and sliding? And being a good player someday. Dennis Smith Jr. Oh. And, and here's why. Great. Call. Yeah, now when I see now, big I'm, fan of his. I'm around these guys in the mm-hmm. summertime. I, I uh, you know, Under Armour. I do the Steph Curry All American Camp and the guard camp, and 
three years ago, Dennis Smith Jr., uh, Markel Fultz, Josh Jackson, they were all on the same level. Mm-hmm. Dennis gets hurt before his senior year of high school, tears the ACL, yeah. comes back this year, plays on a dysfunctional team. People are blaming him for the team not being as good, you know. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, that perception is, well, maybe he's not as good as we thought. But when you talk about a guy who is a junkyard dog, strong, gets to the basket, tough, and by the way, plays with a chip on his shoulder like Josh Jackson has, he's a kid that could slide, and then all of a sudden, a team picking ninth, tenth, eleven goes, oh my God, Dennis Smith Jr. Got to take him. No brainer. Great Why are you so excited? Huh? Because, Why are you so excited about this, Jalen? Because, <laughs> absolutely, because we're going to talk about young potential, and you're going to see of the top ten picks, maybe eight or nine of them are going to be freshmen. But he's the kind of player that you just mentioned. He and Josh Jackson have a level of toughness and tenacity that's not going to translate to numbers. Right. And when you get to the league, you got to have tough skin. The media, your family, your own the entourage. Yeah. And you know what else? The competition. You're playing against the best of the best. And I think what he does offensively is truly going to translate. You know, he he, he has that, uh, and they're not maybe the exact same type of player, but he's got that Kyle Lowry junkyard dog. Mm-hmm. I don't care what your rep is. I'm going to come here and try to rip your head off. And he's always had that, but because he played in a situation where the team wasn't very good this year. Remember, he had a monster game at Duke. 32 points. Yep. They upset Duke. And uh, having been around him, he wears that chip Exclamation well. point at the end of the game. Yep. Yep. That's good. Uh, see, I like having Fran and Jalen here because, you know, it's just not all numbers. It's <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's about, not all numbers. It's about basketball it's a, it's and the, watching the game. It's the educated eye. You know, the analytics are good, but sometimes the eye takes over and you go, this kid could play. That's why I like having you here, Fran. Yep. Another reason hey. I like having you here is because you know the international players more than anybody else in the world. He has tattoos <laughs> on his passport. <laughs> Do you have Literally. real tattoos? No, no. Uh, but I gotta, I, but my, ta- my my passport is is uh, filled up pretty nice. Dog yeah. ears. I got yeah. some nice suits in Shanghai yeah. this year. I bet. I bet. I bet. Like one hundred fifty dollars too. Yeah, I did. I, so, went, I went overboard. I got the one hundred seventy five dollar material. Ooh, yeah, sure. Don't no, tell no, anybody. Look at you, new contract on friend. <laughs> So, with these international guys, it doesn't seem to be an international heavy draft this year. Right. So, who are some of the more important ones? Okay, so you, you got it. You got. I'm, I'm going to give it away, but Frank Nielakina. Okay, mm-hmm. um, he's a guard from France. He hasn't even turned 19 yet. He's six foot five. He's going to go in the first round. He's playing right now. Uh, his his uh, playoffs may end soon, but he can play both guard spots. He's it's interchangeable. He's not really a point, not really a two. He can defend. He's got length. Uh, he shoots it well, and he knows how to play. And remember, what I said about earlier in the show about double A. Triple A, yeah. major leagues. Love that analogy. He's in a league in think about it. You got Spain is the best league in, in, in the world outside of the NBA. But think about France, Gobert, Tony Parker, Batum, mm-hmm. Diao, Fournier. You know, it's an athletic professional league, so he's gonna have a chance, I think, to come into this league, still be a baby, but have a chance to be a good player. I like I like players that come into the NBA having already gotten game checks. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that it's a business yeah. for them already. It's not college. You don't have to go to psychology class, like right. you said. And I like that. Who but that's s- not fair to the American-born players who are forced <laughs> to go to college. Are you serious right now? <laughs> yeah, they like, would love to get checks at 15, <laughs> playing international rules, the lane is wider, Some of the knocking team. the ball off the rim. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the teams I've covered, they do get game checks. <laughs> Some of those guys take pay cuts to go to the league. Huh? Exactly. <laughs> uh, another player, international, that we should be keeping an eye on. Uh, well, you know, uh, t- I'll tell you a great one. Terrence Ferguson mm. from Dallas, Texas. International. Um, I know. Terrence Ferguson. I know, but here's what he did. He didn't go to Arizona. He decided he was going to turn professional and play in Australia. Okay? Ooh. Now, the level of play in Australia is not as good as in Spain as in France, but one thing about Australians, they, t- they play rough and tumble. Mm. They play like it's... Australia. They love basketball. There they too. love basketball. They play like it's Australian rules football. So you had this 18-year-old kid from Dallas, Texas, go down there. Mom went with him to take care of him. Mm-hmm. But he's 6'7". He's really athletic. He loves to play defense. He can really shoot it. And he's a great kid. Now think about that. He's the ultimate 3 and D guy. And he's going to go somewhere in the middle of the first round. Uh, but he went over to Australia I first. want to ask you more about that journey. Yes. Because I talked about American-born players literally being forced to college. 
Do you see more players taking the route that he took mm-hmm. before actually entering the NBA draft? Brandon Jennings did it. Yeah, Moutier did it. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think so. I, I don't think so, Jalen, but I thought you were going to say this. I want you to think about when you were 18, okay, coming out of Detroit. If we took you and put you in the middle. Not going to be able to do it. <laughs> okay. We're going to put you. Forget McDonald's. Okay. Burger King's out. I would have rather no played in. English, let me tell way. you something. I would rather played in the CBA. <laughs> okay. That's what I'm saying. And that's why those international guys, like if I put you in downtown Belgrade as an 18-year-old. Okay. So now you got these international guys that are coming over here. Poor Zingas. And, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, even guys like Jarebko, even the role players have, uh, you know, if they find a niche, they fit right in because they've been professionals. They've been, they kind of know about America anyway because they, they listen to American music. They watch the movies. Yeah. But they also want to come over here and be here and be part of this culture. And the adjustment is easier for them than maybe it was 25 years ago. Thank you so much for joining us, Fran. We don't have too many guests on this show. We don't. And when we do have guests, you know they're good. And you are welcome back anytime. We look forward to the draft. Thanks for the love, Fran. Appreciate you. I love uh, love listening to you guys, and it's fun to be a small part of this. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you, brother. Blue Moon is brewed with Valencia orange peel and a touch of coriander. It's a creative twist on a Belgian-style wheat ale for a taste that shines brighter. Taste responsibly. Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado. We have a segment that we love. It's called Soft Move or Boss Move. We both made both in our days. And now we'll do a Soft Move or Boss Move NBA Draft Special. This one's important to me. Okay? Hugging Adam Silver when you get on the stage. Is that a soft move or a boss move? Soft move. It's a soft move. This is a business transaction. You don't. He's not your boy. You guys didn't go to high school together. You it's not like you haven't seen him in a long time. It's it's just it's just a just give him the handshake. This is business. Hit the brakes. Okay. It's cultural. It truly is. When you're watching NFL players get drafted, they normally look a lot like me. Mm-hmm. They get on the stage. They're excited about the moment, and they do a bro hug. They do the bro hug with Cadell. And the thing is, is once the bro hug bar is set. Everyone else doesn't want to go below it. So then so then Goodell is here giving a bro hug to these 300-pound excited dudes all night long. And then what ends up happening is you give dap, you give a bro hug, and then everybody that comes behind you follows suit. Does the same thing. The exact same thing could take place in the NBA, except our program exists. And since our program exists, we want to tell everybody – that's a soft move. A soft when you move. walk on the stage, young people, you are a professional. Do like you would do at a job interview. Give them the corporate handshake. handshake. Corporate handshakes only at the NBA draft. If I was Adam Silver, I'm sending out a memo. Being like, look, I'm really excited for you guys. I know you're excited too. This is an entertainment show. When you get there, just give me a handshake. This is a business transaction. Don't treat it like you're... A Wayans brother, and you giving me dap, and you rubbing my head multiple times. You don't have to have a coordinated handshake with Adam Silver. He doesn't love you. Next, taking a selfie from the stage for the gram. Soft move or boss move? In this case, they're around twenty one or under. I have to say, and I hate to oh, say no, this. Oh no, you're about to do it. We're gonna disagree on this one. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's a boss move. No, it is not, Jalen Rose. Okay. I've been a television producer for almost 20 years. One thing I know about this event, there are plenty of cameras there. It's going to be broadcast. But the, it's, it, this, this, this event is being captured and recorded so, by cameras. So, so okay? let me, let me, we don't need your extra camera angle. Let, let me ask you this. Because there are multiple people on social media. Is there a statue of limitations of when somebody should be old enough? Is there a statue of limitations... To where somebody's too old to be posting selfies of themselves? Statute. Statute. Yeah. Statute. Yeah. Sta- it's limit. It's limit. All right. <clears throat> we see it all of the time on social media. So what's the age limit for somebody to be posting selfies of themselves, period? Can't have gray hair. That's one. You can't have a child that is over eight. That's two. And I would say... 80 years old is probably the limit. Well, if 80 is the limit and this is the best day of my life, 
that I want to capture, and I'm around 21 years old. I have my phone. I want a personal picture. I don't want to be old man Jalen here. I have to give it up to the millennials. In this case, if you're not going to hug and give a bromance to Adam Silver, it's a boss move to take a selfie. It's a soft move to take a selfie. Next. Having too much hair to fit in the team hat. Soft move or boss move? Well, it depends on the player. Oh, okay. So, Zaza Pachulia's head too big to fit under any hat. (laughs) Without his hair. So, I remember seeing a player... Not just knee deep. He was got knee deep. Was he did the Frank with me? Come out of the stands. Get drafted by the Milwaukee Bucks. Giannis Antetokounmpo. And guess what? His hair didn't fit under his hat. And all I know is he's the only guy in the history of the league to be in the top 20 in the same season. Points, rebounds, assists, blocks, steals. So going by that premise, boss move. Next, preparing your clothing to match the colors of the team that you think you're going to be drafted by. I thought it was a boss move, but it's really a soft move. It's a soft move. Because then you end up wearing a red and white suit. I live out there, so don't go there. (laughs) No, I'm going all the way there. And I'm, what's even, see, people might not know this about the red and white suit. Is The red and white suit was one of many suits that you could have picked from based on the teams that you thought were going to pick. It was actually two. Okay. My other was lime green. Lime green suits should not, like, the, whoever is working the sewing machine and he gets the request, <laughs> oh, I need to make a lime green suit, they need to say no. They need to say no. Like, I'm not doing that. That's why I go to the tailor of legends, Calvin Murphy, Walt Clive Frazier. Now I get my lime green suit. Do you know, you know what? Holla at your boy. Lime green suits are cultural. They're cultural. <laughs> let's be honest. Let's be real about this. Lime green suit is cultural. Red and white suit, cultural. Let's take it a step further. So are gators. I had those on too. Next. Having a signature shoe before you even were drafted. Boss move. Soft move or boss move? Boss move. move. Are we sure Lonzo Ball has a signature shoe? Has anyone seen these shoes? You're So listen. Hit the brakes on this one. Fine. You're asking me, is it a soft move or a boss move? You mean the guy that was a member of the Fab Five, and all of a sudden Nike created a Nike created a shoe called a Harachi that we wore in college, that we also started to wear black socks, and all of a sudden I'm in the NBA, and you know the first shoe contract I got? It wasn't even with Nike. It was with Adidas. And how about this? Are they selling black socks now? Of course. Man, it would be nice to have a patent or a trademark and get a piece of that. They've re-released Harashi 15,000 times. They're dope. So you're asking me, is it a soft move or a boss move to have your own shoe, to own your own brand? It's definitely a boss move, no doubt about it. You actually convinced me to change my answer on that one. It is a boss move. Finally... And by, I saw which one I wanted to say. Oh, finally, crying when your name is called at the NBA draft. Soft move or boss move? Boss move. I'm a crier. I cry easy. I'll probably cry just watching someone else cry when their name gets called. So it's a boss move as far as I'm concerned. Now, I didn't cry. Well, you don't cry easy. Because I was upset when I got picked. <laughs> I was mad. It wouldn't be tears of joy. I was upset. <laughs> so I didn't cry. Maybe if I'd have went number one, I'd be like, ah, <laughs> I didn't expect that. I was going to be Glenn Robinson, my, my Jason suit, Kidd. My suit Grand must Hill. be the best team. <laughs> but I went 13th. I was mad by the time I got picked. And plus, I had a crazy bump underneath my eye. Didn't even want to shake David Stern's hand. Like, I didn't even want to bring any attention to my eye area. Great point. Jalen Rose, you were drafted in the NBA. Yes, that happened in 1994. You've matured a lot since then. A little bit. A lot. But now you've got the perspective where you can give advice to the young men that are about to be drafted on Thursday night. We're going to give them some do's and don'ts. What are some of your do's and don'ts for the players that will be drafted? 
The first obvious one is don't wear a red and white pinstripe suit. Don't don't wear a silly suit. Unless you know you're going number one overall, you are judged by your appearance. As young people, we sometimes forget that. Your suit, your hair, your appearance is going to be taken into account when things get close. And when they look out into the stands, they're like, hmm... He's wearing that red and white suit at the draft. His judgment might not be the best. I think you would have been drafted much higher <laughs> if you wore a more sensible suit. So keep that in mind. <laughs> NBA prospects, as you are preparing for the draft, just learn from Jalen. Your draft stock will slide if you wear something stupid. What's something that we should do? Work out for as many teams as possible. Mm. Here's the thing you're going to hear around draft time. What players are working out for what teams, and sometimes teams are working out players more than once. Yep. I had an opportunity to work out at the Combine. I didn't do it. I'm an All-American. I played in back-to-back the finals. Five. I'm 6'7 point guard. I already put it on wax. I'm a 6'8 point guard. Like, I already put it on wax. And you know what I was doing while other people were at the Combine? I was hanging out with Glenn Robinson in Gary, Indiana, in his basement while he was recording a rap song. Mm. And you know where he went in the dra- you know where he went in the draft? Number one. <laughs> Where'd you go in the draft? Thirteen. Mm. How was the rap song? I don't remember. Something tells me it wasn't good. <laughs> What's something that you shouldn't do? Something that you should not do. Please don't do this. I'll be there. I'll be in I'll be at the draft. Please don't do this. Don't have a payroll when you walk on the stage and give Adam Silver a corporate handshake what do you mean not a hug this is your posse this is your entourage have people on your squad that are actually bringing value not the other way around and here's another thing as a television producer i have to say this there's a lot of photographers there and you want that picture you want that picture of that time that you shook the commissioner's hand do you want that picture to be a nice handshake where you're both separated from each other or do you want that picture to be all pressed up against another dude that doesn't even like you is that what you want and then you're going to hit your hat on his body and yeah. then your hat's going to fall off. Yeah, and there's a hot lights. He could be sweaty. Don't hug Adam Silver. He doesn't want to hug you. Trust me. He does not want to hug you. He'll do it, but he doesn't want to hug you. What's something that you should do, Jalen Rose? Do your homework. Hmm, what do you mean by that? And understand that there are 30 teams in the NBA. Right now, it's the equivalent of somebody working on Wall Street. Read the Wall Street Journal as much as you can. Get all of the information that you can about the coaching staff, about every player that was on the roster, about ownership, about the cities these towns play in. Do not be the guy that sits in a chair and they ask you about the city, the team that you're going to, and you don't have knowledge of it. Mm. Understand that you're now an NBA player. This is your business. They're going to pay you a million dollars at least next year. They're going to pay you a million dollars. The least you could do is just bone up a little bit. (laughs) That's all you have to do. We're talking about 90 minutes. You know what I mean? You don't have to spend a month in a bunker learning about the NBA history. Just 90 minutes so you come in educated to your new team. That's great advice, Mr. Rose. I only wish that you followed it to prepare for these shows. (laughs) I can tell you prepare for the draft, though. You prepare This one you actually did your work for. Thank you. What's something that you shouldn't do? Do you know what acrophobia is? Fear of Akron? (laughs) <laughs> no, and LeBron James wouldn't have that. It's called fear of heights. Hmm. And you know, the higher you get on the ladder, for some strange reason, everybody just can't go with you. Can you ask me again? I've got a better one. Okay. Do you know what acrophobia is? Fear of acting? <laughs> well, you didn't see Jalen versus everybody, clearly. It's when you start to get on the ladder, mm-hmm. and as you start to climb, for some strange reason, some people tend to just fall off. They may be scared of heights. They may be the, 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 the line at the bottom of the ladder may be too crowded. Mm. And all of a sudden, the higher you get, the thinner the air. Do not walk across this stage. This is the toughest one. What are you about to say? I'm this fascinated. This is the absolute toughest one. Don't promise people that they're going to be on your payroll. Ooh. You're not a businessman. You're a businessman. I know that there are going to be people to say you changed. Mm-hmm. You sold out. Mm-hmm. Good. Those people want you not to change. Absolutely. <laughs> Guess what happens when you grow up? You change. 
And you know what else is going to change? You're going to go from living probably in the inner city and your family is going to move to the suburbs. You're going to go from um, you're going to go from managing your checkbook to having a business manager. You're going to go from promoting yourself to having an agent. Mm. These are the people that are going to be responsible off the floor to help your brand, your marketing, your endorsements. They're going to get a percentage of everything they bring to the table. You know what that's called? Eating what you kill. So based on that, you're going to have your family. Yep, your you're friends. going to have your friends. You're going to have your parents. You will have those and Perhaps your siblings. Ladies. And your siblings. And some some draft picks may already have kids. Mm-hmm. You will have those people that, regardless of what happens, have been ride or die. That you must take care of. That you will take care of. That is mandatory you take care of. Take care of them. Everybody else? They got to earn their keep. And if they're not putting you in a position to earn more, you got to take this advice. People come into your life for four reasons. To add, subtract, multiply, or divide. Choose wisely. Do not have a payroll when you shake Adam Silver's hand. Do not have a payroll. That's great advice, Jalen Rose. Sounds like... You had a payroll when you shook David Hazard's hand. <laughs> <laughs> or you could call it an entourage. What was that, Harlan? All right. Jalen, and finally, what should an NBA draft pick do? I want to quote the great American philosopher David Jacoby mm. when he says people in the world don't celebrate enough, celebrate your accomplishments. Enjoy yourself. Smile. Stand up straight. Yeah. Be grateful for the Maybe opportunity. Maybe you didn't get picked to the team that you wanted. Maybe you got picked a little bit later than you wanted, but you got picked. You're now an NBA basketball player. Do not feel stress. I promise you, the team that you wanted to pick you, they would have drafted you, except they didn't want you. Mm. That means the team that picked you is happy to have you. Celebrate the achievement. You got down on your knees and you asked for this opportunity multiple times. It's here. Embrace your loved ones. Appreciate the moment. Live for right now. When you fly to the city and you do your press conference, that's when it becomes a business transaction. Great point, Jalen Rose. That's great advice for these young men who are about to be professional basketball players. That's all the time we have for today. Thank, Thank you, you so much for watching the Jalen and Jacoby Mock Draft special. Thank you. Make sure you subscribe to the Jalen and Jacoby Thank podcast. You. You're far too kind.